Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, as we open the book of Judges, chapter 12, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and for his wisdom, so that we may more properly understand the symbols that we are going to address today, so that we may then be further prepared to give a message to the others within this movement, to the church, to the world at large. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the night's rest that is behind us. We thank you for the day that is before us. We thank you for the study as we begin and open your word today. As we open the examples that we are seeing in the book of Judges, we ask, Father, for your blessing and for your guidance. We seek wisdom so that we may more correctly understand the symbols that are now before us. We ask for your spirit, for your spirit's guidance and his watch care over this meeting. May your angels also attend us. Help us now that we may be guided, directed, and come to an understanding so that the message that will be before us may be better understood. We thank you for this opportunity. We also thank you for your, your many blessings in bringing us back together. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting and those that will view it later on the internet. Be with us now. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. As we were ending yesterday's meeting, We come to Judges 12.1. Now, 12.1 can also be a symbol for the 12th day of the first month. And we know that from the 10th day of the first month on to the 14th day, we have this preparation time the preparation time for the Passover. And the men of Ephraim were called together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. Now, it's interesting to me that this same situation, yep, as it's being said in the chat, this same situation had occurred with Gideon as well, where the men of Ephraim were upset with Gideon for not calling them. So why is this repeat occurring? I mean, the men of Ephraim were definitely called with Jephthah. And as I recall, they were given the opportunity to assist Gideon. So why would they take this kind of an attitude? What are your thoughts? Self pity, and they just didn't listen. Okay, so um, so they're upset. I mean, basically because uh, Jephthah and um, uh, the tribe, the half tribe of Manasseh, there 
um, in conquering these people, would there be spoils, or what is it that they're that they're jealous about? Is it just the glory of victory, or is it? Well, now here you're looking at it literally, where we've been addressing this figuratively as mm -hmm. being that Jephthah is the message of July 18th. Right. So would it be that the, that the men of Ephraim are upset because they were not choosing to study as did Jephthah and those that followed him? Well, yes. But I think there must be, like in this literal situation in understanding this, um, you know, because Jeff always talked about how there were sort of two motivations that that people have when they are seeking to have people follow them. And one is, of course, the glory and praise of men, and the other is money. Well, and, and, you know, Jeff always seemed to think that the, the biggest one was the glory and praise of men, which I've always had a hard time understanding. Um, I could understand, you know, families that, uh, you know, if you're um, running a ministry and you have wife and children and, you know, you're having a hard time making bill bills and you're doing a full time ministry, that there would be a temptation for some to uh, want to have funds directed their way to help them. And, and they would justify it, you know, just that, you know, they're doing the Lord's work and so forth. So that I can understand. I mean, I understand the idea of being in, in a hard place financially and that it can affect your motivations. But here, in just this literal story, um, I'm, not, I'm not particularly sure why the Ephraimites are upset. I mean, basically, they protected them from invasions from the, uh, the children of Ammon. They could have affected Ephraim as well. So they, to me, I think they would be thankful. Okay. In this situation, was there spoils in relation to this with Gideon? Um, I don't remember particularly if it mentioned spoils. Wasn't wasn't there weren't there verses that talked about the earrings? Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there is spoils involved. Yeah. There were spoils involved with Gideon. And there would be here. I, I don't know that there were because we're not we're not told that. No, but I mean you're going to be taking you know, because people had jewelry on them and they had weapons and things that could be taken. Um, I don't know. I'm looking more at Jephthah as being more the praise of men versus the spoils. Yeah. Well, I would say that that definitely seems to be more the focus here. But, um, you know, because in the other one, we, we do have the spoils mentioned specifically. But, you know, so trying to understand the problems in the movement presently. Um, I mean, one thing we've seen in the movement is jealousy. Quite a bit of it. Right. So it seems to be a huge motive in why people take the positions they do. Um, and, and I mean, it seemed to be the, the main thing that was the opposition to me personally, uh, because I know about it, um, you know, with people like Tabo. Uh, one is it was money also because he, uh, you know, which I can see now. Um, but, you know, just the idea that, you know, he would take ideas from other people and sort of uh, take the credit for them. You know, he did with this with Colin's understanding of uh, uh, the Republican uh, presidents and the the presidents of the general conference, right? He never gave Colin credit for that. And he did a lot of that with blessing stuff as well. Um, so people 
seem to be territorial. They seem to, I don't know, it just, it seems like an odd thing here for the Ephraimites to be upset. And, and we could definitely relate that to what's happening in the movement today, that there isn't really a reason for it. And also, it's a misrepresentation here as well. How is it a mis misrepresentation? Well, because Jephthah said they did invite them. <clears throat> or they're saying they weren't invited. But we have the same situation in Judges 8.1 with Gideon. Right. So yeah. is it possible that the situation with the Ephraimites is one where they were so comfortable in their own little world that when the call comes out, join with me, whether, whether you're talking Gideon or whether you're talking Jephthah, when the call comes from their brother, the other portion of Joseph's inheritance, that they decide time will tell. Well, I mean, if we want to look at it in this movement, I mean, because that's what seems to be taught being it's talking about here in the context of which we place this it seems very very solid um you know people have been invited and continue to be invited to these studies now i'm not sure how many people watch them on youtube like of people from you know our group um but you know we don't have many that that show up live and of course it's kind of understandable it's pretty early in the morning um, you know, for some people, not for me, but just some people. Yeah. Well, lots of people. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, doesn't seem early to me, but, uh, but anyway, you know, so it's understandable why some people maybe don't come to the morning meetings and watch them later on video. And it, and it's also understandable. Sabbath is busy. And if you're involved in the other groups, uh, you know, you may just watch the videos at another time. But, you know, there were people who were following these meetings for, for a little while at first. And then when conflicts arose, they stopped, stopped participating. And, you know, it, they, they've had an invitation to study these things that we have found. Now, you know, as I've thought about this um, this morning, We're, we're in a dangerous situation within this movement presently. Why? Well, if this applies to us and we're going to have this shibboleth, there is a further division that occurs over this shibboleth, which we're going to look at. Um, and, and we'll see what it represents, that is many people will reject again the foundation of this message, the foundation of Adventism. But the, the ones that will be rejecting it are primarily going to be those of the movement that have rejected the message of July 18th. Right. Even though they may give lip service or not say anything about it, they already have... Well, and, and to me, the motivation, I mean, there's a reason why people don't look at things. Uh, I mean, we had, you know, in one of the studies, you know, for five hours, uh, one of my friends from, from Canada attacked me and the message and everything, you know, saying it, it needs to be made simpler, it's too difficult, all these different uh, character sort of things that were talked about. And... And it didn't make any sense to me because this is a very powerful truth. But the thing is, if you don't look at it, if you don't spend the time studying it, if you don't know what's going on, 
you can easily reject something out of a self-imposed ignorance. And I'm not trying to be so hard on people, but, you know, we, we studied about um, the Cottrell's, see how this applies to this movement, that this is, to, to take up this message that we had by becoming involved in this movement, to take up the message of July 18th, is not some small thing that you can say, I don't have the time, or it's too hard. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yes. if the footmen tire, then what's going to happen when the horsemen come? You know, I've talked to some of these people, and a lot of it is just plain hurt feelings. Hurt feelings often stem from pride. So get off yourself and get into the word is my advice. I say, why don't you use Matthew 18, where Jesus counsels us to go to our brethren and discuss it with them? Yeah, and, and the truth is supposed to help us see our condition, right? So we all know we have these problems. We, we all have problems. We're all frail, faulty human beings. We all have pride. We all have self-dependency. Um, so we're no different than anyone else. Uh, I don't like calling these people or labeling people in some way because we're all a part of this. It's not an us and them sort of thing. But we do Save know. these people because they don't want to be named. Yeah, I know. But I don't are, still want to. Are we them. watching all theirs too? What's that, Rosanna? Are we watching all of theirs too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we actually study their material too. So we don't just watch it, we study it and discuss it, what's going on. You know, so for instance, we've been studying Leona's paper. Um, we studied Odilio's material. Uh, we studied Colin's material. And and I think that's an important thing to do. I think we need to be looking at this to see whether we're in error or not. I mean, that's the whole purpose of these studies, is to examine everything and to examine it in the light of God's word, following Miller's rules. And as we do this, we end up coming to, this, to these insights in these passages here in Judges um, that just fall into place. I mean, maybe I'm self-deluded. I don't know, but I can't see how I possibly could be. There's too many objective evidences uh, that allow us to understand what's happening here. So here we are in this situation. We, we're part of this movement. It's a serious matter. We know that there are people who do have hurt feelings um, and that causes them to act in ways that aren't rational. And, and we have to also check our own feelings. Are we acting rationally? Do we have hurt feelings? Are we really just interested in truth? Are we trying to defend self? All those things we need to examine. And that's why it's these studies on righteousness by faith are so important. But here now we have this, this part that we're going to be studying here in Judges uh, chapter 12, verse 1 to 12, verse 7, dealing with this conflict with Ephraim. Now, um, it's interesting to note that Judges 12, verse 1 is the 12th day of the first month. And the 12th day of the first month in the story of Ezra is when they leave the river Ahava. Now, how would that apply to what we're studying here? Wouldn't it be that this is a symbol of returning to the old paths? Okay, so it's, it's a symbol of, of returning to Jerusalem, right? Right. Um, we know that 12 verse 1 is going to be connected to 20, uh, or, or the 12th day of the first month is connected to the 20th day of the ninth month. That is, remember the four days that are, right. um, that they come and mourn 
uh, the virginity of um, Jephthah's daughter. Yeah, Jephthah's daughter, right? So, so we're taking these as these way marks that that occur in Millerite history, the four principal way marks, and the four principal way marks: the first day of the first month, the twelfth day of the first month, the first day of the fifth month, and the twentieth day of the ninth month. Those are the ones mentioned um, specifically in in Ezra. And we know the story of Ezra applies to this movement. We studied it in many different ways. The three days, uh, the line of the number of, of days representing months, right? So just so many different ways that we have. And now here we have this, this conflict with Ephraim. And so this conflict is going to go to the root of, of the problem that exists. So this is an opportunity for us in this movement. But it's also a warning. Okay. <clears throat> now, as we're looking at this, dealing with the 12th day of the first month, mm -hmm. one point that we had failed to address in the last week plus of studies, mm -hmm. what is the meaning of Jephthah's name? Uh, well, I thought we looked at it. I mean, um, I don't think we have. Uh, he will open. So Jephthah is representing the opportunity to receive greater light. Mm -hmm. And we also know that when he went to uh, Zaphon or northward, as it says in the King James. Right that this this refers to that which is hidden or dark so we have the opportunity the symbol of he will open but mm -hmm. the opportunity for us to receive greater light mm -hmm. and we know that this light is always not just an intellectual thing that it it's truth that exposes our sin Right, because if you, if you can't receive light and not address the sin that is exposed by right. light. Right. Christ opened the eyes of the blind, he said, be open. So we have to be willing to use that eye cell, which only comes from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is part of the condition of Laodicean, a wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And that blindness, of course, is um, that inability to see your true spiritual condition. That's why the ISAV allows us to see who we really are. Right. Now, we do have the symbol which Angela, I believe, had pointed out about the passing over that connects us to the symbol of the Sunday law. Um, somewhere, anyway, I think it's where thou, thou passest over. So we, we had that connected. And also we have Ammon here, right? So we know uh, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, and the chief of the, or Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Are mentioned in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 41. If I remember correctly. Um, and then we have here, um, you know, one of the things, uh, even just going back to Jephthah, remember when, he, if his name's he will open, remember when he makes his vow. And we have the door the a double door right the doors right. dual that open and his daughter comes out right so and we see that 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 vow and his daughter coming out is this sacrifice that has to be made that we didn't foresee that the prediction in predicting nashville and making that public 
Um, are we going to keep that vow or not? Right, is the question. We have no choice but to keep the vow. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but you know what I'm saying, that pe some people don't make that choice. They ended up rejecting July 18th and everything it meant. So, so we're in this situation then that um, this message of July 18th has opened up to us all kinds of truths, but Ephraim is going to Zaphon, to darkness, to this hidden place, right? They're, they don't want the light. They don't want the, the door of the heart open because then it will expose their condition. And in order to, to justify what they're doing, they have to give a false report. They have to claim that they weren't invited. Okay. So we have the men of Ephraim represented by those that have set aside the message of July 18th going Zaphon into darkness and they say unto he that will open Wherefore, pass you over to fight against the children of Ammon and did not call us to go with thee. We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. We will destroy your family. We will destroy your reputation. We will make of you none effect well gossip is like a fire it's darn hard to put it out once it starts what was like a fire so my net is unstable so i might be dropping out i'm praying it okay. stays up. yeah the the tongue is a small member but it kindleth a great fire I just, I find it interesting as, as they're putting it there that we will burn thine house upon thee with fire. So we have burn, which I believe you would call that saraf. Yes, saraf. That's where we get the word seraph for angels. It means okay. Brighter burning ones. Yeah. And Ayash for the fire? Yeah, Ayash. I mean, in English, we, I mean, if, if you're going to burn something, you have to have fire. I mean, the only other burn I know of is a chemical burn, but you're not going to burn yeah. a house down with chemical. Mm -hmm. At least not, not that I could think of. So how should we approach this with this particular verse? I mean, it, it is kind of fearful because that means that those that have rejected July 18th, of which we all know many within the movement, yeah. are going into darkness. Yeah. They don't want to have this opened before them. Well, see, that's the thing that troubles me. So, I mean, and I've made this point in various ways, but Jeff was quite clear that everything that this movement was about led us to July 18th. That's why he proclaimed it. It wasn't some little side issue. It was actually the direction that his movement had always been going. It tied together 
every thread that he had ever presented. And we know, of course, that 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 it's also then uh, the result where Adventism was leading, right? Because we're repeating Millerite history and unsealing those uh, thunders, and in so doing, receiving the light that the Millerites never received. So when we reject it, I mean, we not we're not just rejecting, you know, Jeff's movement. And we're not even just rejecting Adventism, we're rejecting Christianity as well. And I, I don't see any way of escaping it. You know, I, I can't figure out, there's no logical attack that can be done against what this movement has, has wrought, that God has done through this movement what he has shown us that's why they'll attack personalities instead of the movement they don't know what they're talking about they haven't been weaned from the church's tit you know what i mean they just want to be fed milk and smooth things and pat each other on the back okay well yeah well yeah we can't really talk about people that way i mean i understand what you're saying but we have to recognize that this is about this movement and about messages not about people right because we could easily be rejecting July 18th and not know it, because we might reject the light that actually exposes our sin. So I don't, I know what you're saying, but I don't like the us and them sort of language. Okay, received. I know I'm tactless. <laughs> okay, but but it's not just that. It's how we look at ourselves, because we should be seeing ourselves in all of this. We shouldn't be seeing other people. And we should look at these as messages, not as groups of people, you know, Jeff representing our study group or something like that. This is about a message. And we may make a pretense of believing something. It doesn't mean that we really do. Because the belief of something actually, when it's truth, will bring about a change in the person's life and character. It'll make us see things correctly because that's what light does. It takes the blinders off. It, it opens up those secret things of darkness so that they can be seen, so that a room can be cleaned, that a house can be set in order, that our sins can be exposed. And that's why we're studying truth. That's the only reason why we're studying truth. So, so Dwight, and, um, you had... A, is that uh, consistent with your point that you're making here or is there more no i would i would say that that's right in line with what i'm trying to say okay i mean the all of us know many that have been within this movement mm -hmm. there are those that have gone off and chose to study things much different than the message of July 18th. Uh -huh. Now, there are fragments of the movement remaining, but these fragments are to a point where they're deciding that their own opinion is greater than any of of the other opinions or other studies that have been presented. Mm -hmm. I know of, of people, I know of those that claim to be within the movement that are setting aside many of the warnings and the admonitions that Mrs. White had given. That are deciding that the health message doesn't apply to them that it was something for a prior time. We cannot afford to be that spiritually blind because that light has been given for our admonition. Here we have situations where Ephraim has now obtained a great victory over the children of Ammon. 
not Ephraim, excuse me, Manasseh. And the men of Ephraim are jealous because they had the opportunity, they didn't take the opportunity. Now they're coming to one that would open to them great light. And they're willing to destroy him and his family because of their own indolence. Yeah, it's interesting here. So I'm just reading Kiel and Delich's uh, commentary on Judges 12, verse 1 to 3. But it's it's kind of interesting what what they say here about um, uh, verse 2, uh, verse 2 and 3. It says, um, it, uh, Jephthah's appeal to the Ephraimites to fight against the Ammonites is not mentioned in Judges 11, which we noted. It doesn't mention it there. Probably for no other reason than because it was without effect. The Ephraimites, however, had very likely refused their cooperation simply because the Gileites had appointed Jephthah as commander without consulting them. Consequently, the Ephraimites had no ground whatever for rising up against Jephthah and the Gileadites in this haughty and hostile manner. And Jephthah had a perfect right not only to ask them, wherefore are you come up against me now? To fight against me, but to resist such conduct with the sword, which of course is the word of God. So it's it's pretty interesting whether you know. I mean, obviously he's just looking at this this scripture uh, and trying to figure it out. But but that's really what we can see has happened. It's basically people feel that they weren't consulted or that they weren't involved it's just simple human pride that often makes us reject light the very thing that would help us and help us see our condition we reject and of course the only thing that can be done when we're falsely accused is to present arguments from god's word But I think that's the, what we have to do to begin with, is present these, these answers from the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah, because you can't, you can't meet reviling with reviling. No. A soft answer turneth away wrath, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's Jephthah. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. You didn't come to face the Ammonites when you were called. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me and and the children of ammon are representing um what specifically did we decide as a as a message what are the, what is it representing well is it not representing the church was okay. my question yesterday yeah, and, and, and we would say it actually, it can't represent the church. It would re represent a message that is opposed to, I mean, it, the church could be carrying that message as well. Um, but it's a message opposed to July 18, 2020. It's opposed to the system of Bible study that we are engaged in. It's opposed to the movement. A message that is is seeking to undermine an attack everything that this movement is about, but it's within the movement. It's not something outside of it, right? Because okay. it's a relative. 
Now, of course, that exists with the church, as we, we talked about. But it's what we're more concerned about here is what's happened in the movement itself. And my view has been for a long, long time that the false message of righteousness by faith has is is part of it. Now here we see Leona presenting the correct message of righteousness by faith, but we've seen others presenting a counterfeit message. And they don't even seem to be aware of it. That is, they seem to rejoice in when they hear the truth being presented, but when they present it, they present error. And, and they can't see the difference. Because to them, it, it is just merely one of a party spirit. It's just merely a stance they take with no understanding. And, and that's what I think the children of Ammon represent. That's the enemy that needs to be fought against. And that, that the thing that fights against it, the thing that has corrected uh, this movement has corre that corrects Adventism, that puts us on the right track, is following a method, method of study that led to the July 18, 2020 prediction. All right. It was interesting because uh, I was conversing with uh, someone way back in 2014. I happened to run across this uh, discussion on the Internet that I had back then. And this person was accusing me of being uh, using the same methodology as Shepherd's Rod. And Jeff has always pointed out that Shepherd Ro Shepherd's Rod is a counterfeit of this movement. And I know quite a bit about Shepherd's Rod's history. Um, uh, you know, Victor Hutoff and, and, uh, and some of his views and how he misused the Ezekiel 4 and um, verse 4 to 6 and things like that. But the person isn't all that wrong. That is, on the surface, there is a great similarity to the way that Shepherd's Rod looks at things, and we do, on the surface, but not once you dig down into it. And, and I think the big difference has to do with our understanding of Millerite history. Shepherd's Rod does not go back to the old path. It continued to reject light that was established. That is, it's not new light, but it is using methods that are similar, uses analogies and parallels um, that, that we use. And, and so what we have is we have to have a message that's going to put Adventism on the right track. There's lots of false messages out there. And this movement has been ordained of God to have a consistent message with the past while also being open to new light. And this is unique. Believe me, I've, I've watched all kinds of videos. I've read all kinds of books and articles. I've had discussions with people of all different views. You know, you've got the Feast Keepers, you've got Lunar Sabbaths, you've got um, uh, the Anti-Trinitarians, you've got... Um, that God does not kill, and, and just on and on, all these different people with different types of time prophecies, and et cetera, et cetera. And on the surface, somebody looking at our movement would say, well, well, that's just another one of those. But once we delve into it, there is a consistency that goes right back to the beginning, not just of Adventism, but of Christianity itself. And it sheds light upon everything that we've ever believed as Seventh-day Adventists. Nowhere do we come to the point where we say, well, Adventism was wrong about this and it needed to be corrected. We'll say, we, all we see is Adventism was right and this light establishes it, makes it more clear, it adds more detail. But it never undoes anything of the past. And so the children of Ammon are trying to undo what God has wrought, right? Because what is the argument with the Ammonites? Why are they going to war?
they have an so alternative here. Okay, Stephen first, Stephen. They have an alternative view of history. Okay, right, right. So they misinterpret or have an alternative view of what happened when the Israelites originally possessed the land, right? So, so why did I ask that question? How does this apply then to what, what I'm talking about? Stephen? Yeah, so it's like a, a denial of the foundations. Yeah. Right. So we have a denial of the foundations. And, and that is the thing that's being fought against. Now, the Ephraimites then, when the foundations were being attacked and they were invited, they didn't come. But now they're saying that they weren't invited. And they're upset with Jephthah. Does this represent what's happening today in the movement? I think this has to represent what's happening in the movement. Okay, can we have some yeah, specific examples? Can we give some specific examples? can but i'd be revealing the people that have odds against yeah. you but i know what you're talking about okay well yeah i wasn't necessarily thinking about how we reveal people but um so we know that people were called and and when we look at all of the things that we have been studying um, it is establishing Adventism, as we pointed out. I mean, just, just the study of Ezra 7 to 10 alone uh, shows the history of this movement in its parallel with, with the history of the Millerite history in, in very fine chronological detail. So, so people were invited, and yet they weren't interested in fighting against this revision of history. Um, okay, let's look at righteousness by faith itself. What is the problem? I mean, we, we we're going to be looking at this in, um, in our Friday night studies. But can we say what, what the problem is regarding what the wrong understanding of righteousness by faith is that exists within Ad Adventism and has infected this movement? The understanding of righteousness by faith that has permeated Adventism and the movement is it's not faith in God, it's faith in man. Ah, okay. Right. That is, whether we have a high standard of righteousness or a lower standard of righteousness, we delude ourselves in believing that we have reached whatever requirements that righteousness is. I know I didn't say it, it's not a great sentence. Well, do you understand what I mean? Uh, you know, I used to, I used to, it's what's that? Self-satisfaction. Self yeah, I've seen that. Uh, people are telling me, well, as long as you're tithing and as long as you're sticking with the church, the church is going to make it through, press together, brothers and sisters. Well, how can I press together with that corrupt body? <laughs> you know, it's impossible. Oh. But, but even, even within ourselves, we, we, we create a standard of righteousness that we can attain to, right? So some people have a lower standard of righteousness because they have less self-control. And, and so we can create a standard of righteousness that is higher than others around us that we can meet 
and that we can feel then satisfied that we are saved. But the standard of righteousness that God has set is beyond human comprehension or ability. Correct? Agreed. It's something that we can, it's something that we can never see in ourselves because it isn't in ourselves. It's in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't develop a Christ-like character, but a Christ-like character never sees the end. A Christ-like character never sees, I mean, it's, it's focused upon Christ and his righteousness. It's not focused upon, you know, that I have attained or I've reached some kind of level. Or you've arrived or anything. Yeah. And when people focus, and I'm not saying that it's wrong to say, you know, we need to eat correctly and we need to dress correctly. Those are things that are important. But when people sort of present almost the pinnacle of, and, and I don't mean to say this in a mocking way, but sort of I've seen presented the idea almost that the pinnacle of righteousness is not eating between meals. As if that is what righteousness by faith is about. Now, temperance is an important part. Of righteousness it's one of the first steps in in reaching righteousness we have to be in control of our feelings and our desires but that's not the end goal well when we're dealing with this this one verse yeah judges 12 3 mm -hmm. Judges one, two, three. Mm -hmm. I would have to ask if this is not a symbol of first, second, third angel's message. So therefore, a symbol of righteousness by faith. Yeah, well, well you can actually see in these three verses a reform line. Okay, but what, what I'm getting at, yeah. when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands. Now, the translators would have given reference to the following. Now, when we're looking at 1 Samuel 19.5, <clears throat> it states, For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and did rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? What's being asked here? What's being asked in this verse? It's giving us the representation that David went before Goliath, not caring, not caring if he was going to live or die. He did it for the glory of God, right? Mm -hmm. That when he sought God's glory and not man's glory, when he laid his own glory in the dust, God provided the manner in which he was able to slay Goliath, right? Mm-hmm. But here's the antithesis. 1 Samuel 28, 21. And the woman said unto Saul, and saw that he was sore troubled, and said unto him, Behold, thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice, and I have put my life in my hand, and have hearkened unto thy words, which thou spakest unto me. Who is speaking to Saul in 1 Samuel 28, 21? Well, this is um, uh, the witch of Endor. Right. Saul was seeking his own glory. He was not trusting God. Mm -hmm. David was willing to trust God no matter what the outcome was. Saul was not. Mm -hmm. He chose that 
it was going to be his way and his way alone. The message of righteousness by faith is one where you're willing to trust God so completely that you care little for what happens to you. You let God lead where God decides you mm -hmm. need to go. Mm -hmm. That's been the problem within the church. That's been the problem within the movement. That is the problem within us. The problem within humanity. So Job said it. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? And then Psalms 119, 109. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. Yeah, and, and it should be noted here that the word that's translated life is nephish, okay. not, not kai, which is another word for life. So nephish is a reference to... Um, um, How do we put that? Um, it's soul, self, life, creature, person, appetite, mind, living being, desire, emotion, passion. So it's it's all of us, the complete man, that's referred to here. Okay. Right. So so this is what's being talked about. You know, because Hebrew has those two basic words for life. So. Jephthah, when, when he went out, he accepted that he was being led of God to go against the children of Ammon. His message was one that went very much against the message of the children of Ammon. Mm-hmm. His concern was for the character and the righteousness of God, not for his character. He placed that the children of Ammon were trampling upon the message that God would have given. And he stood up for God without concern for what was going to happen to him. Mm -hmm. The situation that's been occurring here, whether we're looking at this within the movement, whether we're looking at this within the church, is very much like with what is going on in the world. They want control. Specifically, they want control of the money. They want control of the economy. Because if they control the economy, they control the people. They don't care about doing thing, things God's way. At this point... God is very clear. Thou shall not kill. Yet, what is happening openly within the United States at this time? Oh, well, you, you, you should be allowed to abort your baby right up to the moment of birth right up until after the child is born, you should be allowed to, quote, abort the child. How does God look upon that? He doesn't look upon it with favor. Because there 
they are taking the life of another, of an innocent in their own hands. Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. Mm -hmm. What symbol are we seeing here? Okay, well, I don't know the symbol, um, but what, what you see here, I guess the accusation is um, that these Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites, that the Gileadites are fugitives, right? refugees. That's the idea here. So, so Jephthah, I mean, this, this comment that I'd read in Kiel and Dillage, um, I mean, that's part of the argument is it's why basically do you have Jephthah um, as your leader for one, but also you really are just fugitives. You're not really. Riff -raff. Yeah, riff -raff. Riff -raff. interesting. Why would you see it as riffraff? Well, because that's how some folks have looked at me. I've been called a, I won't even say some of the stuff I've been called, but one of the choice ones was a, a overbearing windbag who's greatly in need of psychiatric help. <laughs> well, disreputable persons is riffraff. And I mean, part of what their arguments are, in uh, especially in their secret gossip, because um, I know quite a bit about what's being said. I've had recordings of things that have been said. Um, but basically, um, when it comes to me personally, people have seen me as someone who was rejected by Jeff and, and kicked out of the School of the Prophets. So the question is, well, why should we listen to a message from this person? We need to be going through the regular channels. The movement isn't one person. And especially a person that, you know, people can see a lot of defects in. So, so this is kind of the arguments that are made. It's an attacking of the man not attacking of the message directly. Oh, man, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to look at the message, not the messenger. I, I even told one person, even if we were Balaam's ass given the message, I would still focus on the message, not the messenger. Yeah, and, and the thing is, we all, have, we all have our weaknesses and faults, the character defects, personality problems, uh, history, all those things. And, and so it's easy to start to point to the fault of a person rather than addressing um, what's being taught. And, and we saw that in that five hour study on Friday night back in whenever it was, February or something, um, where it was pretty clear, maybe it wasn't February, it was later than that. Anyway, it was pretty clear that the person wasn't interested in actually addressing the points. They brought up points, but those points were bogus because really when it came down to it, it was about feelings. It wasn't about what was being taught. It was about a party spirit. What side are you on? And and this is the problem that we see here. I mean, this this section here is hitting very close to home for us in this movement. And we have to be careful about how we deal with others that we differ. If a brother differ with you on certain points of view, are you going to follow the counsel that Ellen White gives? Are you going to make them out to be a heretic? Are you going to misrepresent their views? 
or are you going to sit down with them? And and I've actually invited uh, some of the people to present in our studies uh, what they have been presenting other places, and they refuse. So I've had to go through those studies on my own with everyone here. But everyone's invited. There's no secrecy here. There's no us and them. We are all brethren, and we need to come together to study God's word. Not to be attacking each other. But we see here that when the Ephraimites come, the only defense that uh, Jephthah has is the word of God, the sword here in this case. But it's representing the word. It must represent the word. Mm -hmm. How can it be else? Yeah. Okay, so um, verse 5, are we going to go there now? And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, Nay. So they're doing an examination of the Ephraimites, person by person, message by message. So here again, in verses four and five, if we were to look at what the translators had used, first, looking for verse 4, and Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. But Psalm 78, 9. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. What type of soldier carrying a weapon turns back in the day of battle? Yeah, well, there's there's this little uh, anecdote. It's I don't know if it's true, but um, you can find online all kinds of uh, uh French rifles. Okay. Um, they've been dropped once, but otherwise never been used. Yeah. Um, right. So there's the idea of the French in the Second World War that they caved into the Nazis. Um, so, but yeah, that's somebody that's a coward. Now, now what, what did they call the government that came in France? About that time, Vichy, Vichy, and what do you call cold potato soup? Is that the Vichy sauce? Vichy sauce. Je mange la la soup de pois. So. <clears throat> At this, you know, at, at this point, I understand what what you're getting at, Theodore, because when when you have an army that will not fight, when you have an armed group that turn their back in the day of battle, mm -hmm. you're dealing with those that will not stand up, that will not bear their burden that will not give the word that they are to that they were empowered to give 
And that's been what we're seeing within the movement and within the church. And I yeah. think Mrs. White bears that out very correctly. Yeah, we don't seem to be advancing. Right. Now we seem to be on a, on a surrender and a surrender retreat or a retreat, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, there was another point here. Uh, well, you think about that in verse five. We're to compare this with Joshua twenty two eleven. Judges 3.28 and Judges 7.24. Oh, yeah. So that was the, the part in where it talks about the passages of Jordan. Right. Of course, these are the fords, right? Okay. So the Israelites took the fords of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and we're going to have this situation that arises uh, in verse 6. Um, so I just well, want to point out the passages is fords. That's Arba, Ma'arba. An Arba we know is a Ford. There's a place called Arba. Right. Fords. So, and the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. Right. So that's the, the Arba, the okay. Ford. And then. Judges 3.28, and he said unto them, follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. So here's your Arba again. Mm -hmm. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, come down against the Moabites. And take before them the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. And this is after the victory had largely been won. Right? Uh -huh. So we're dealing with this. We're being shown that, again, the Ephraimites did not choose to use their sword in the day of battle. They turned their back to the battle. To be direct, they were cowards. Mm -hmm. Now in 12.6. And they said unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of the Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. That's a lot of people. That's a huge number of people of the tribe of Ephraim. Yeah. And, uh, and one, one thing we know about the tribe of Ephraim is at the time that they, they crossed the Jordan, um, they had 40,500 uh, military men. Okay. So, so this is 42,000 men. It's obviously... I mean, they had a lot of young men um, that grew up to become these men that are going to die here. Um, but it's also <clears throat> that these were of Ephraim that would not take up the message. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, this is like, 300 years later or whatever. Um, but, you know, so Ephraim obviously grew um, to have 42,000 men be killed. And still, uh, Ephraim became the largest of the tribes. Okay. 
Now, Psalm 69.2, I sink in a deep mire where there is no standing. I am coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. 69.15, let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Okay, so one of the things is the word shibboleth means flood or flowing stream. Okay. Um, right? So the, right. Um, So when we're dealing with uh, uh, these quotes, Psalm 69.2, um, this is when it talks about the floods, it's using the word shibboleth. Right? And 69.15. That's why these verses are here, correct? Right. Right. So, so the water flood, let not the water flood, that's that's the shibboleth or the stream or the flowing. So, so in understanding what shibboleth is, I mean, one of the things we understand about this word is uh, we, we have it in connection with the Sunday law. All right. I mean, the idea of an overflowing scourge, though it's a different word. Could it be a message? Well, it's definitely a message. And it's a message that can't be pronounced correctly by the children of Ephraim. Is this the message of righteousness by faith? Yeah, I would think it has to be. I, I can't see any other option. Because it, and, and all that's different is one little detail. It's one dot above a letter. I mean, obviously they, they, they write it in Hebrew as a sibilet. They put a samak in the place of the shin. So the shin is the Hebrew letter. Um, here, I want to show people this so that they can see what we're talking. There you go. Um, okay, so this is just Wikipedia. They got it. Lots of places you can find it. So here you have the Hebrew shin. And sin. now, um, so you can see it's called a sin if the dot is on the left side of this and if it's pronounced like an S, right? And then if the dot's on the right side, then it's pronounced as sh, like in the word shop. Here it's like in the word sour. Um, so this is the same Hebrew letter. Now, remember when Jesus talks about uh, the the, the dot or tittle right being in the law and these would a tittle actually refers to these little uh, markings in the Hebrew letters the little parts of the letters not a, a dot or a tittle will be removed and this dot I, I believe refers to the word yod a yod or tittle um, and then they have these dots and there's different names for them I can't remember all the different names um sukuts and uh degesh and so forth different types of dots and vowel pointings but these these ones here are are on a consonant it's not a vowel it just shows you a different way in which that consonant can be pronounced and um so this symbol the interesting thing about the word shin is well the letter shin is worth 300 in hebrew gematria that is, they have um, each of the letters in Hebrew rep represents numbers. Some of them represent like just the single digits, like Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel is three, Dalit is four, etc. Uh, and then you have some that represent, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, etc. But with Shin, it represents, and it's the second last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tav is the last one. And Shin represents 300. Now, if you spell it out, the word shin, 
it's shin yod nun. A yod is worth 10. So aleph bet gimel dalet hey vav zayin het tet yod. Yod is the 10th letter. And then a noon is worth um, 50. So when you add that together, a shin is worth 360. So even though I'm saying that the shibboleth represents righteousness by faith, um, we have this one letter in this word, and it represents something that would represent time and the symbols that we are using. So the question is, can we connect righteousness by faith to prophecy and to an understanding of prophecy? I think we have. Like, I mean, so what was the problem in 1888? Why was the message of Jones and Wagner rejected? Why was the third angel's message rejected in 1888? because the leadership no longer had based their understanding upon prophecy. Right. So, so one is they had rejected the first and second angels' messages. So you can't have a third without the first and second. If they had accepted the two messages, they could have accepted the third. Would, would you go back to what you just had up on the screen, please, for just a second? Okay. Um, so. Okay. Consider this for just a moment. Okay. When we're looking at this with sin, we have that over the the dot over to the left. Yeah. When we have shin, we have the dot over to the right. Yeah. But in both cases, the Hebrew letter has three figures. So does this Hebrew letter represent the message of Revelation 14? There are three angels' messages. Exactly. Well, I mean, that, that definitely would make sense. So the emphasis is not on the first as it is in sin the emphasis is on the third as it is in shin because you must as you were just saying you must have a first and a second in order to have a third mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I know Hebrew, though, is read from right to left. So, I mean, in Shin, the, it's the first that's where the dot is above, if, if I'm reading from right to left. But I know what you're saying. Um, I'm just now, going by the appearance. Yeah, the other thing is these also, as we were talking about before the study was recorded, is that this represents a hand. That is, uh, the Jewish priests would hold up their hand, uh, which were Spock. Leonard Nimoy use that uh, to represent that live long and prosper symbol where you hold up your hand in that that fashion um, and that comes from from because he's Jewish that comes from uh, the the Jewish rabbis holding up their hand in that fashion but one of the things about it is it's it's a hand now did you say they hold up both hands yes Right, so they hold up both hands, and it's it's a type of blessing or something like that. Correct. Um, now, what this reminds me of is uh, Daniel chapter twelve and uh, Revelation chapter ten. Me too. Okay. Um, so in Daniel chapter twelve, we have. Um, when he swears right uh by him that liveth forever and ever he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven right down 12 verse 7 and and the significance of 12 verse 7 is of course on the charts we have god had held his hand over a mistake in some of the figures right and we know that he held his hand over the top right hand corner of the chart 
because that's the only place where there's a mistake in the figures, correct? Okay. Because the date, 1843, at the bottom of the chart is not a mistake. Right? Correct. Because it's, and, and, and neither is the, you know, the 1335, but they're adding to 1798.45, and so the answer is 1843. That's not a mistake on the chart. The mistake on the chart is in the top right hand of the chart, and it's in the calculation of the 2300 days plus 457 equal 1843, and 677, uh, 2520 minus 60, 677, uh, being 1843, and also this calculation 712, 84, 30 to 2520. That's not necessarily a mistake, that's correct, but that would be covered over by God's hand. Right? So we have this hand, and these two hands, people have pointed out that these would be the two 1260s. What did you say the quote in Revelation? Uh, Where Daniel, was it? Well, Daniel, or, well, the quote in Revelation is Revelation uh, chapter 10. That's the seven thunders. When they yeah, uh, no, he mentions one hand there though. Yes, right, exactly. So when we get there, he's going to just raise up. Um, so in Revelation or Daniel chapter twelve, he raises up both hands, right? Um, I, but in Revelation ten five, he raises just up one hand. He lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, right? So we're going to see differences and similarities in Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 10. There's two so, hands somewhere else um, in the story where he holds up his hands and he had, needs help to hold them up. Yeah, so we have, um, that's Moses' hands being held up by Aaron and, uh, is that what you're talking her. about? And her? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so when we look at at, Rev, at the symbols here, so we have twelve seven, and we can see on the chart the first uh, it's it's seven twelve are the first two numbers in the right hand corner of the eighteen forty three chart, seven and twelve. So there's significance in that. It's also in the eighteen sixty three chart. Uh, it's going to be representing that as well, in just in a symbolic form with the 70th week. So my point is that um, this message is about these symbols. And if, if the hand represents 360, if shin represents 360, because the word shin, the gematria of it is 360, that's the symbol for a day for a year, right? Correct. But also the shin itself represents 300, and that's a symbol for, which comes from Gideon, but it's a symbol for God's people at the end of time. All right. A certain group of God's people at the end of time. Now, um, when he swears and he lifts up um, his hand in, because uh, he's going to stand upon the sea, uh, I saw a stand upon the sea and upon the earth, this angel that lifts up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. So he's going to lift up his hand and that's going to be in Revelation 10.5. And 10.5 is the 10th day of the fifth month, right? That's a symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem. So we have all of these symbols in these verses, in, in what's being depicted, that this is, is something that this shibboleth then, we can relate this to the hand, right? To the message of the 2520 and its connection with righteousness by faith. That is, prophecy is connected to righteousness by faith. Right. And in, a in another way, the left and right hand is represented is the separation of the goats. 
and and we can see then shibboleth is using this we could say a left and right hand representation right of two classes and the left and right hand place on on uh two sons that come to me too right so ephraim and manasseh remember he crossed his hands jacob did when he blessed ephraim and manasseh right so so there's lots of symbolism in, in here probably more than we can see well we we have just begun to touch on this portion of the verse mm -hmm. and there's more yet to be done yeah which we're gonna have to do tomorrow correct mm -hmm. so are there any other questions comments or concerns about what we've just been studying yeah i was trying to recall whether when christ call, uh, calls uh, you know when he stays the four winds does he lift his hands then i just can't remember yeah, we'll look, that up tomorrow. look that up for tomorrow angela yeah okay make, make that your assignment Okay, any other comment? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many examples that you are providing us, for the many symbols that we need to consider, and for the time that we have spent together. Be with us today in all that you would have us to do. Direct our paths, show us that, where we should go. May your will be done. Help us and guide us now. Be with us in all things, for we need you this day. Help us so that we may have faith that all that is done is done to your glory and not to ours. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.